So um, I'd like to convene this meeting of the Board of Directors for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for September 14th, 2023. Holly, would you take the roll? President Smalley. Here. Vice President Hill. Here. Director Ackman. Here. Director Falls. Here. Director Mayhood. Here. Okay. Um, are there any uh, changes to the agenda this evening? Rick? I'm sorry. Are there uh, any changes? No, there are no to changes the agenda. Okay. I'm All right. Um, oral communications. Um, does any member of the public um, have anything that they wish to comment on for items um, other than what's on the agenda that are within the district's purview? Seeing none here, I see none online. Uh, and I understand that there were no actions taken in closed that's session. Correct. Thank you. Um, given that, um, we can then proceed to unfinished business. The one item that we have on the agenda this evening, the cost of service analysis and the rate study. So, uh, Rick, Kendra. Um, I, I do believe we we're going to turn it over to the, to the chair of the budget and finance committee for the introduction and move forward. With the presentation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Well then, Gail. I'll go ahead and do that. Um, I prepared um, uh, four slides um, that will be at the beginning of this presentation, and I'll be followed by is it Sudir or uh, Lindsay from Raftelis who will present some models. Um, and basically, the goals that we have for tonight's meeting um, as a special meeting of the board is to receive input from the public and to discuss the revenue model um, that Raftelis has developed in order to move the board towards some kind of consensus view of uh, how we feel about the revenue model because we have to make those decisions so that Raftelis can take the next step, which is actually developing alternative rate structures, which we're not really talking about tonight. Tonight, the focus is coming to some sense about what we think about the revenue model. I don't anticipate we're gonna vote on anything tonight. I think the idea is to get a discussion and if there's anything that needs to be voted on, uh, we can do that at the next meeting on the 21st, okay? So after the meeting on the 7th, I think for some of us, um, especially Jeff and I, there were a lot of questions that we had that we felt that we hadn't really um, that sort of arose about the revenue model. And we also recognize that we kind of got off on tangents and didn't discuss some aspects of the revenue model. So the um, scenarios that you'll see tonight are actually slightly changed um, when they show the models from what, they, what you saw on the 7th. And they, oh, thank you. They will reflect um, the consensus view of the budget and finance committee and staff um, that developed um, at the budget and finance meeting that we had on Tuesday. And we have one member of the committee here in the audience, Jim Mosher. And I do want to want to recognize that Bruce Holloway was there as a member of the public and he actually makes made some very useful comments that, that kind of got uh, incorporated into our thinking as, as well, okay? So really there's kind of two categories of questions, big questions that kind of come up when we think about the revenue model. One yeah. is how do we rebuild the cross country raw water pipelines? Do we do it above ground more or less as they were um, before the CZU fire or do we bury them? And the reason this has this decision as a first order decision is because the difference in cost has a large impact on um, the revenue needs that we might have and also our ability to acquire or accumulate reserves. And then the second category of questions have to do with the assumptions that Raftelis has to make in, term, in terms of developing the revenue model. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, which is essentially um, 
talking about uh, how do we rebuild the cross country raw water pipelines. We're going to see scenarios tonight that actually um, show different scenarios for those two. So one is assuming that we build it above ground at an estimated cost of about 25 million. And the other is that we do it buried at an estimated cost of 52 million. I will say that at the Budget and Finance Committee, it was a view of the committee, um, a consensus view that um, we should go with the above ground option. The main reasoning here being that although um, the uh, buried option could be achieved with only a slightly higher need in terms of annual revenue and maybe a little bit more in debt. It has a large impact on our ability to accumulate reserves and we've been under reserving for years. Um, and so if we went in that direction, it would be very hard for us to uh, accumulate reserves at the level that we think is, is appropriate. And then other, there are other factors that come into play in this decision as well, having to do, I think, largely as some of the members expressed concerns about the environmental impact um, that would come with burying it and that this might um, get a, a large response from um, members of the public. Um, but that's one of the reasons we have public meetings is so that they can express that. Um, there's also the concern that we could get in, snarled up in uh, a lot of delays having to do with, um, uh, well, basically Santa Cruz objecting to what might happen if we start uh, cutting a bench and releasing sediment um, into the creeks that feed into the San Lorenzo River. Um, but as I said tonight, we're gonna see the scenarios of both models. Um, next. Now let's go to the second category of questions about the assumptions. And one of the questions we had are, were we comfortable with the rates of inflation that were adopted for the various categories of, of expenses? And I think um, most of us felt a little worried about the fact that Raftelis was using long-term 10-year averages. Um, and the reason being that our belief is that we're still coming off of the edge or the end of the uh, COVID related um, inflation and that the inflation rate for a lot of the things that the district has to buy and purchase to do the work that it does and the specialized skills that some of the labor that we have is actually more expensive than say the sort of market basket that your average consumer would have. So what we asked Raftelis to do is to, to calculate it with using the three-year averages for the first two years, and then assuming that we would go back to some kind of long-term 10-year average for years three to five. Um, the revenue model assumes that expenses will grow at this rate of inflation. And a question that immediately comes to mind is should we, in the model, account for new incremental one-time costs or new ongoing expenses? And these could, in many cases, these ongoing expenses would be things that are sort of unfunded mandates that come down to us. I mean, an example was our, uh, for example, it was Santa Margarita was a good example of an unfunded mandate that we're now having to um, pay for. Or another one would, would be, um, you know, if, if there are new rules about PFAS that's basically gonna put all water districts um, in violation and we'll all have to buy expensive uh, equipment to fix that. We didn't make any modifications to the model for this, which makes me a little nervous personally, but I think um, Sudhir convinced us that if we're acquiring or accumulating uh, our reserves properly, we should be able within those reserves to accommodate one-time hits. To the budget. And, and one big one that's in mind is it may cost us something like $250,000 in terms of legal fees and environmental fees to get the conjunctive use plan through, right? That, that's an example one. Um, so, but, and then the other question of, well, what about some of these ongoing things? And, and I think the, the sense was, um, we don't know how to set that number. <laughs> and so because we don't know how to choose that number rather than just pluck something out of the air, we didn't change the model. 
Another question was, is it realistic to assume the district could complete $27 million of capital projects in fiscal year 2024 and more than 50 million in fiscal year uh, 2024 to 2026? And I think um, there was a consensus in the room that given the history and all of the things that happen in terms of environmental impact and everything and um, supply chain issues was no. And so what we asked um, Rick and Kendra to do was to spread out the capital expenditures over a longer period of time so that they would go all the way out to the end of this rate study, which would be 2028. Um, and that has the effect of um, meaning that we don't necessarily need such a big injection of cash to get us through the next year or two. So it sort of smooths the capital expenditures. Next. Continuing on on these assumptions, um, we have, uh, are the reserve targets set uh, appropriately? And the answer is yes. They're based on the district's reserve policy that was adopted in 2020-2021, which um, the two major categories, there's a few more smaller ones, but the two major ones are that we have um, 4.5% of the annual operating budget as a reserve, and that we have 2.5% of our total capital assets in reserve. And you have to, for that, you have to make an estimate of what is the value of our total capital assets, and the one that is used in the model is 375. I think that's 4.5 months. 4.5 months, I'm sorry, you're right. Thank you for correcting that. Yeah, so on the operating budget, it's 4.5 months, not percent. Okay. okay, then the question is, is how fast do we want to reach the target reserve levels? The model that we saw from Ralph Tellis the last time basically tried to get us there in the second year or at most the third year. And I think um, we felt that given that we have not adequately reserved in the past. And um, given, but more importantly, the fact that we have this huge amount of expenses that are related to the recovery from the CZU fire and the storms of 2022, 20, 23, that it may not be realistic to think that we can accumulate all the reserves and go right up to the target in the second year. And so what we instead said is that we should increase reserves every year and then reach the target levels in year four rather than year two. So we're just spreading out that requirement. Um, another was, do we want constant annual increases in revenues or should we front load those increases? And I think the, uh, as we heard from Sudhir, I, I asked this question at the last meeting and Sudhir said, well, you, normally what districts do is they just set a, an amount like 9% every year for five years. And um, we basically thought that um, given the extraordinary expenses that we've had and the fact that we didn't basically didn't have an increase last year, um, that it would make sense to front load the revenues to be a little bit higher in year one and two, and then have the revenue um, requirements drop in the- The, the increase amount. Yeah, yeah, the, in, the right. So that, um, okay. And then the, quest, the final question is, do we wanna take out debt? And if so, um, in what forms? In other words, could those be loans or bonds? And I think, um, basically we pretty much have to do something to get us through the next uh, couple of years in terms of cash flow and the expenditures that we have. Um, in the revenue model that you'll see tonight, we show debt in form of a market loan, um, 20 years at 4.3% interest. Um, we had some discussion of the possibility of, of trying to get a bond, but um, I think the Basically, our decision was is as, as a board, we should take the most conservative approach, which is um, there's no guarantee that if we tried to float a, a bond issue that it would pass. I mean, typically less than half of them pass. Um, and it's our job to make sure that the district stays solvent. And so in this assumption, we are assuming um, what I've put up there um, and this, doesn't mean that, and basically I think um, what we will do is 
by the time we get to making the decision um, for how much there, we'll discuss how much debt, what type, and we'll discuss this more fully um, because all of this is, this market is very fluid. And so, you know, to try to set it now would be um, not uh, very prudent. But what we're trying to do is put something into the model that is conservative and protects the district. If I could comment yeah. on yeah, that, um, the market for debt changes quite a bit and can change very rapidly. This is based on current conditions. We don't know when we, we would have to go out for the debt and we don't know what the conditions will be at that point. And so we had to make a choice and we chose to base it on current conditions and a standard market loan, but when the time comes that we do go out for the debt, we should shop and we will shop for the best deal, whether it's a bond issue, or participation notes, market loan, we'll evaluate all the options and, and go for the best deal. But when you're building a model, uh, it's a little complicated to add all of those different options in there. Uh, and the whole idea here was to, uh, uh, as, as Gail said, be conservative and uh, use current numbers that it, if we went out to the market today for a loan, what we'd be looking at and uh, address what the actual form of the loan would be and what the interest rates will be at the time when we need to actually go for it. Okay. So now I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Sudhir. Yeah, Bob. Uh, um, I think I think what I, I think it'd be better if we let Sudhir go give right. his part. And hang then, on. because all I've really right. talked about is the assumptions. Yeah, hang, hang on a sec, though. There's some okay. clarifying questions I have about the assumptions. I, and I, the, I, and, I, the, and the fact to, that this I'd was like not to. part of the agenda up front that we got. This is this is completely brand new. And I'd like to ask a few questions about I, what you I'd did. I'd like to go through these questions again. But I'd like to have Ref tell us, do their presentation first. And then come back to these. I want the understanding but, of what they're. Presenting. But my understanding of what's going to happen if we do that mm -hmm. is my understanding of what they're going to be saying is going to remain open, mm -hmm. right? And I won't be able to get to the core of what it is they're presenting. So I want to make sure that there's a few things. I mean, first of all, it's, I don't know that there's ever been a presentation that a board member has done like this. This is really great news to know, but I wish we'd had this in the agenda packet. So we could have had questions coming up front. Mm -hmm. So if we could at least get through a couple of clarifying questions before doing that, that would be really great. Two questions, and then let's move on. Okay. Two questions. So um, on the first one- And I'd like to make these quick because I do want to get to ref telesis. Yeah, you know, I understand that. But because this got thrown out here at the last minute, I think it's important that we at least have a little flexibility here. Um, on the reserve target levels, when you're talking about reaching them, were you talking about that being a combination of debt and cash or cash only? Uh, because in the last presentation, we use reserves fairly promiscuously. Mm -hmm. And debt reserves versus cash reserves are very, very different. I, you made that right? point last time, Bob, and we did not change anything. Okay, so, so it is still so the it is way a, you, 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 it's not, it's unchanged. Okay, and so the impact of that is that if we have a debt that says you have to do things in three years, that debt goes away, it's no longer available for reserves. You'll have to take out more debt at that point. It's not cash, it's fake. Okay, if you could go back to the previous slide, please. Um, relative to the um, expenses, was it your guys' assumption that the five-year budget that's being presented here is only for the purposes of the rate study, or is it a committed budget that will be passed by the board to cover this five-year period? That is, are these expenses like the last rate increase where it was showing an increase in operating expenses of about 3.5% a year and our actual was closer to six budgeting or is it a, this is a commitment we're making to the community? This is a model, Bob. And so the questions that you're asking, which you asked last time about 
um, how we might decide to restrict or assign some of the money that we get. Those are, I think, discussions that we should have as a board at the time that we start discussing. That's not what I'm asking. Sorry. That's what, what I'm asking is like about the asking. operating expenses. Are the operating expenses that you're that that they're presenting here? Is it your guys' view that that's a model for the rate study, yes. or that it's a budgetary thing we're committing to the community? No. I I I don't think we can basically say that this is a, a commitment um, if, if to in part because when we do budgeting, we do it on a two year basis. We could do it whatever basis we want. Two years is only something we decided to do well, that was I, better I, than one. But we could certainly do five. Taking us off of the yeah, I understand direction. that. The, the issue we have here is if it's not a commitment that we're making to the community, then the model itself is not a commitment to the community either. And that needs to factor into their decision about whether they approve it or not. That, okay. You're right. Okay. Um, I'd like to move to Ref Tellis's uh, presentation now. Um, who will be giving that? I will... Um... Okay. Start that presentation. Let me share my screen. Good evening, President Smoli, members of the board. This is Sudhir Pardiwala with Reftalis. Uh, we have our project director, Melissa Elliott, on the line as well, as well as Lindsay Roth, who is a financial consultant. Uh, I'm filling in for Teresa, who is still on vacation, should be back at the end of this week or early from beginning of next week. And uh, hopefully she'll be able to take it on from here. I don't think so seeing your screen. Yes, we don't see your screen yet. Oh, you don't see my screen? I thought I should no. share a screen. It's a presenter. Here, here it comes. Okay. So last time we covered a lot of the slides, and I tried to go a little faster this time. So if but if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. But I'll try to go a little faster. Uh, so we don't repeat a lot of the information that we were covered last time as well. So we are going to focus on the financial plans, obviously, as Director Mehud indicated, we will identify the inflation factors that we are going to be using, we'll get into that a little bit, and then discuss the various plans that we have for water and wastewater, the financial plans. Uh, so we looked at, again, this chart that shows the CPI for the San Francisco, Oakland, Hayward area. And we took the average of three years, uh, which was slightly under 4%, but we assumed 4% going forward for our operating expenses, including salaries, uh, most of the operating expenses. We had certain expenses like benefits and utilities and so forth that were inflated at a higher rate. Uh, but our operating, most of the other operating expenses, we are increasing them by 4% based on a three-year average. The utilities, as we discussed last time, they are increasing at a higher rate. So we have taken that into consideration as well into uh, both for power as well as for other utilities uh, at a higher rate. Uh, the construction cost index, which is used to inflate the capital cost uh, we took the three-year average again, and we are assuming here, or we estimated that the average would be five and a half percent in the first two years, and then we come down to four percent in subsequent years. So, in uh, compared to last time, we have increased operating expenses for the first two years to four percent instead of three percent that we had, and then it was three percent after that. And for, for the capital cost, we are assuming that those will increase for the first two years at five and a half percent and then drop down to 4%. So that those are the changes that we have on the inflation costs. So let's start with the financial plan for water. Uh, again, going to the current uh, revenue sources, we have 85% of our revenue coming from current rates, 9% from taxes and assessments and the remainder from interest income grants and other non-operating revenues. 
the an important assumption in the financial plan always is what kind of growth do we have both in terms of accounts as well as in terms of water usage. As you can see here, we are assuming essentially eight accounts per year except in FY24 where we have this consolidation from Brackenbrae and Forest Springs, which is about 150 units. And then we are estimating that the per account consumption will not change and therefore it's a very minimal increase in demand going forward based on current demand. Uh, this particular slide shows us the water sales over the last several years and this is an important assumption in the financial plan as well because the more water sales you have, the more revenue you pick up and, and, and therefore you can spread your costs over a bigger usage base, so to speak. But as you can see in FY22, we actually had a reduction of about 10% from the previous year. Uh, and, and we are assuming conservatively that going forward in, you know, we will be using that same level of consumption uh, to project our revenues going forward. Uh, to give you an idea as to how your expenses are distributed amongst different functions, essentially, uh, you're looking at supply and treatment and distribution that are about the same, goes to 57% of the total expenses, and then the remaining are spread amongst finance, administrative, engineering, and watershed. Just one second. Uh, you, this does not mean that uh, you know your variable expenses are only twenty nine percent, but because your salaries and benefits fall within each of these categories, actually, they they make up about seventy percent of your total expenses. So. Um, as Director Mehud mentioned, uh, we have taken the CIP and projected them, spreading them a little bit more than what we had previously. So originally, I believe last in the last presentation, the first year in FY24, we were at about $27 million total. Now that has dropped down to about 24, 24 and a half maybe and, and so forth. So we have dropped the CIP in the first two years and then built it up in the later three years compared to what we did last time. The uh, total CIP that you see here is about $72 million, uh, which averages about $14 million per year. The length of the bar represents the total expense and the colors represent the different uh, elements of the financing that we see. So starting from the top, we have uh, this brown bar represents the fire surcharge revenue these are the bond proceeds that we would be based on the debt that we will be issuing. These are funds left over from the previous debt issues that we have. And then this is the grant funding that you see here. Uh, the FEMA proceeds don't kick in until FY25 and beyond because there's always a lag uh, getting FEMA proceeds. And then <clears throat> uh, we, you can see here that we don't have any rate funding at all in 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 the first five years here. We are going to be using basically debt, uh, FEMA funds, uh, fire surcharges, uh, you know, and grants to fund our expenses. An interesting element of our revenue structure is to identify how our fixed costs and fixed revenues are collected from, or we spend and collect from our rate base. So when we look at our expenses, this is just the operating expenses. It's an average of the, last, of the next five years. We have about 94% of our costs are fixed and only a small percentage, which is basically related to power and utilities that is, is the variable rate, is the variable expense. Uh, however, on the rate side, uh, we have about 37% of our revenues coming in from the meter charges, which are fixed, and the rest from, uh, which is 63%, would be coming from the rate revenue. Uh, 
in general, I think when we look at uh, utilities uh, having a ratio, a fixed, a fixed component of about 30% is not unusual. Um, in our case, since we are getting surface water and well water for the most part, uh, we have very little in terms of variable costs and therefore uh, the uh, this the the fixed revenue that we collect here uh, could be considered under collection of the fixed revenue. But the issue is that the moment you increase that fixed revenue, you're impacting your low volume customers. And so there has to be a balance in terms of what we you know, charge on the fixed portion versus what we collect from the variable portion. And also recognize that the increase in the variable rates helps to uh, incentivize conservation. Uh, the California Urban Water Conservation Council in its pre in its uh, past few years actually had recommended that the fixed charges not be more than 30%. Uh, when we hit the drought in, in 15, 16, more and more agencies started increasing their fixed charges. And so the 37% that we're collecting here is reasonable. It's not unusual. And I think when we do, when we look at uh, setting rates, we would probably be considering that as well, uh, retaining this same level of fixed expenditures or with slight modifications. Uh, the water reserve targets we discussed last time in some detail, uh, four and a half months of operating budget, uh, which is about $3.7 million. Uh, two and a half percent of, I said four and a half months, two and a half percent of replacement cost, uh, which is $375 million. That target is established at about $9 million. And then we have compensated abs absences of one third of the balance on the audited financials, which are about $600. So we have a target of $200,000 on those. And these are pretty reasonable in, in terms of, you know, generally for operations, we typically have three months. So you are a little bit more conservative, which is good. Uh, capital replacement, 2% uh, of the replacement cost is pretty reasonable. Two and a half percent basically gives you like a 40 year life on your on your uh, assets, you know, so that's a good um, good number as well. The fire surcharge is one of the elements in the revenue structure that we have currently. It's based on the meter size. It's a restricted funding, uh, a restricted fund where the money can only be used to fund the CZU projects. Uh, currently, we are limiting the total revenue to be collected from fire surcharges at about $5 million. And at the rate that we are collecting it, we should be done by FY2026. So any CZU costs that are incurred beyond this time frame will have to come from rates and would not be a, a separate charge on your bill. Uh, for example, the CZU projects continue to 2028. So the remaining projects, there would not be any funding available from the CZU, uh, from the fire surcharges on to fund those projects. Um, so as we discussed last time, we have two scenarios on the water financial plan. The first scenario is above ground uh, for the P vine and Clear Creek supply lines, which is approximately $25 million uninflated cost going from FY23 to FY28. And we have already applied for FEMA grants on this. So it's we should be guaranteeing the 90% reimbursement that uh, typically would be expected from this project. So under this scenario, basically what we are looking at is doing 10% per year for the first two years in FY24 and 25, that is 10% in revenue adjustments, does not necessarily translate into rate increases of 10% for everyone. The uh, subsequent years from FY26 to 28, we are looking at 7% per year as shown here. And this particular scenario requires us to issue 19 million in debt to finance the capital expenditures that we are we have in our on our books. There would be no change in the fire surcharge, which is limited to five million dollars in revenue. The what you see here are the ex, the, the total reserves that the district would have over the five year period, and this is the target that we just discussed: the four, four and a half months of operating expenses. Uh, and the two and a half percent of the asset base, replacement asset base. 
Uh, we fall a little bit under in 25, uh, but we are showing reserves about target in subsequent years here. Now, the reason we have this about target is when we take a look at a longer term scenario, when you look at a 10 year scenario, we see that if we, if we were to uh, reduce the revenue adjustment that we are proposing here, the 7% revenue adjustment that we are proposing here, then you would probably wind up with much higher revenue adjustments in the ne next five year period uh, to, uh, to fund all the capital costs. And therefore we are proposing that we have the 10% in the first two years and 7% for the next two years. So sorry, just so I'm clear on this, are, are the slides we're looking at in the agenda the same as what's up here? I, I don't think there was slides. I'm not sure what, what we- uh, I don't know. No, I, I think that, that this has been- a, This has been updated since- This has the been updated was from that. So the, in other words, these slides now are based, so they're used, um, this, the assumptions that we discussed in- can I clarify part of the presentation? I think we have slides on our website, not as part of the agenda. Yeah, it's not part of the agenda. From last week's right. presentation, this week the slides have been updated based on the admin. Uh, I'm sorry, the budget and finance committee's feedback, and so the this presentation right. will be posted to the website right. following this meeting. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry. In the agenda that I'm looking at here for the 14th, there is a series of slides. Are those slides those slides? No, no. The one on the okay. <clears throat> I mean, up to a certain point, they look the same. But yeah. starting there, there are slight the, modifications are because we changed some of the assumptions. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. it looks like some of the numbers changed fairly substantially, actually. Okay. So, okay. We just want to make sure I was clear on that because there's no reason for anybody to follow this at this point. So, but okay. as Jamie said, this will immediately go up on the district website. Um, but this has been a work in progress, and okay. Rick and Kendra and Sudhir please, have been working really proceed. hard on this <laughs> for the last few days. Uh, so this is a slide that I have added from what you know that we didn't have in the previous slide, which represents the financial plan under scenario one. What it shows you are the expenses. The green bar up here represents the operating expense. The yellow bar represents the debt service, and then the gray bar here represents the reserve funding. The, the dashed line here represents the revenue at the current rates if it did not make any revenue adjustments. And the black line, solid line here represents the revenue with the proposed revenue adjustment, 10% in the first two years and 7% in the subsequent years. So when we look at this, uh, what, we, what we see is obviously that, you know, uh, we are setting aside funds and reserves in each of these years here. And this results primarily from the fact that we are have that debt issue that helps us to offset some, the capital costs, and therefore we are able to put aside funds in these in the in the reserves in these years here. Okay, so going to scenario two, which is the buried pipeline for Peavine and Clear Creek, the uninflated project cost here is estimated to be $52 million. And uh, under this scenario, we are not confirmed with the 90% reimbursed from, from FEMA. So there is some question whether we would get the full 90% funding from FEMA for this particular project. And as we, I think as Director Mehud discussed, there might be some environmental concerns as well associated with this, with this scenario too. So under this scenario, we are looking at a 12% per year revenue adjustment in FY 24 and 25, and then 10% in subsequent years, 26 to 28. Uh, we are proposing a 23 million debt issue in FY 24. Again, no change in the fire surcharge. They remain at the current levels and collect the $5 million. So in this particular scenario, because we are in, have increased the amount of debt that we are planning we uh, and, and pushing the capital projects out, uh, we fall below target in the fourth year, but then we make it up by the fifth year. And again, the reason why we have this going in this manner is because as uh, we have future capital projects that need to be funded in the subsequent years, and that requires us to maintain a higher level of reserves than what the target shows here, yeah. 
So similarly, the financial plan for this particular uh, uh, is consistent with what I just showed you, except that in FY27, uh, we had a higher capital cost and they will now need to be funded through rates as opposed to from entirely from reserves. And in fact, we draw down our reserves. You can see the revenue line here shows this. So we have some costs here which need to be covered through reserves, which is shown by the gray bar over here. So while we add reserves in the first three years, we actually draw down reserves in 27, which was represented. You can see the, the reserves were down in 27, and then we begin to add them back again in 28. Okay. I think that completes the water scenarios, financial planning scenarios that we had. Now we move over to wastewater. So I think we discussed this. Basically, we have 56 customers on the wastewater side you have there are several elements of the collection system that are described here we have a treatment system consisting of three stage trickling filter system and clarifier tanks uh, the last upgrades capital upgrades were completed in the 20, 2013 time frame and then we are still operating under a discharge permit uh, from 20 uh, violation of a wastewater discharge permit from uh, april 2016 uh, the expenses here, you can see we have three different expenses here, the contract and professional services, salaries and benefits and operating expenses that are about the same here, which represent almost 80% of the total costs, more than 80% of the total costs, and then you have general administrative maintenance and facilities. Uh, these percentages appear to be kind, you know, kind of out of uh, context because uh, the total expenses we are looking at here are very small. It's only $120,000 in expenses that we are looking at over here, which is the average of the next five years of expenses. Uh, we are not planning any CIP in any year except in 2031, where we have a big project uh, of about $2 million, which when inflated comes to about $2.7 million. There is a potential to get some grant funding on this, but uh, we don't know that for sure. So we may want to use that to offset uh, rate impacts or revenue impacts. And so we have proposed three different scenarios on, uh, for this particular uh, wastewater utility. The reserve targets remain essentially the same four and a half months on the operating budget. As you can see it's a very small number, $45,000. $46,000 and 2.5% of the replacement cost of $3.4 million, which works out to $90,000. So the sum of those two is about $136,000 in total targets that we have. So under the first scenario for way project, uh, capital project would be funded by grants and we would incur an additional $900,000 uh, in debt in FY31, uh, and we have assumed three and a half percent for 20 years over here. If under the, the first couple of years, because we inflated the ONM expenses from the previous presentation, the next year, instead of 3%, we have down to 3% after that in subsequent years. The first scenario, the second scenario, we are looking only at the grant without any additional debt, and that causes us to increase our percent, uh, revenue adjustments to 15% in the first seven years, and then uh, dropping down to 10% in 2031, uh, and then uh, flatlined after that. In the third scenario, which is all cash funded, we are essentially looking at 25% for the next eight years. And we can see how the reserves change. Uh, we need to build up these reserves under each of the scenarios so that we can fund these capital costs that are that we are incurring in 2031. Okay. Uh, and that concludes the wastewater uh, financial plans. The next thing that we need to look at is, you know, what are the next steps that we need to do is to identify which projects CZU project scenario we want above ground or underground and finalize the financial plan, which financial plan do you want to go with on water? I think once we make a decision on which project we go, I think we have identified what is the financial plan that we need to go with. 
but on wastewater we do have three options that we can select on from any of those three once we have decided that then we 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 can start the cost of service analysis and develop rates uh, look at potential changes to the rate structure uh, under the current rate structure or alternative rate structures for water i have a question about the wastewater would that be at the end um Yes, okay. we're going to let him finish and then we'll go to the board and Sounds come good. out to the public with questions. Um, so the schedule that we have right now is, you know, hopefully we are able to get to the rates by October 23. If you have a decision on the financial plans, uh, we can do public outreach in the October, November time frame. Uh, we can have another board meeting in November, at which point they would make a decision on the 218 notice which would need to be uh, issued by the end of november so we could have a public hearing in january of 24 and then the rates would be implemented february 1st 2024 our financial plans do assume that you will follow this particular schedule so that we can implement rates in february if this is delayed further then obviously we lose revenues uh you know for the months that delay that we have and that causes an impact on the reserve level that we have shown in in this presentation and with that we can open it up to questions now okay thank you um at the beginning of the presentation uh director mayhood posed a number of questions uh to us uh one of the more significant ones was uh how we reconstruct uh, CCU piping. Um, I'm not clear uh, on uh, how the Budget and Finance Committee got, got to those conclusions, but we'll get there. Uh, but it was more than that question. There were a number of others that uh, were being posed in those slides. Mm -hmm. um, has the Budget and Finance Committee concluded on those? Um, that, with the, that's with, what we did at the meeting on Tuesday. Okay. okay. So there was a discussion of all of these things and basically okay. what you saw there was a consensus of the committee plus the staff. Okay. Um, and that's where it comes from. Okay. All right. Um, well, um, what questions are we being asked to uh, delve into tonight? Uh, besides the last one that I see coming up in Sudhir's presentation here, um, is what I'm trying to uh, get to at this point. Um, the first is how do we how do we install that piping? Uh, the rest of the questions that you were bringing up, um, and why don't we look at uh, those first? Um, Can you pull up slides? Yes, oh. those slides from from Gail. Yes. Um, and who has those? Okay. Kendra will. Uh, okay. I just need a Sudir so we can stop sharing. Okay, um, I want to start with this first one. Uh, the Engineering and Environmental Committee uh, discussed this aspect um, this, at a meeting this morning. Um, and uh, to have a cost of 25 million for the above ground piping, um, I wasn't aware that we had any costs for that yet it's just an estimate we're just we're making okay. it up as we go okay along. Um, so um for the financial model that's what i believe we're doing here we're putting in a number for the financial model i don't believe we're deciding at least it's not my impression that we're deciding we're going to go above ground at this point well, that's what I think the decision is all about. Uh, let me let me finish, Bob. Uh, I don't think we're deciding above ground at this point versus below ground. We're trying to put money into that. The board hasn't had the full discussion of those options yet. Uh, 
with uh, weighing that. We did have a discussion at the committee level this morning as to whether uh, we could agree based on staff's recommendation that above ground was appropriate. And we said, no, we couldn't come to uh, a decision at that point. What we did request was come back to us uh, with the uh, developed cost estimate uh, that supports how you would propose to do the above ground. Can so I, can I ask a clarifying question of Rattelis though? Um, let me let me finish here to kind of set the uh, scenario for for the, the board and the rest of it. So the committee uh, didn't say that. So just to convey the full board hasn't uh, bought into that. This is being brought to us at this point to see. So what do we think on this? So with that, uh, Oh, oh, yeah. Like you need to add something, Rick? To go ahead, Bob. I, I want to ask a clarified question yeah. over I've us, which is I thought I heard that if we don't decide tonight, next week, on above ground or below ground, they can't proceed. That's correct. Okay. So, you know, we have a situation. Have to decide tonight, but some we, we, we have a situation here where there is a lot of delay in getting to any numbers around above ground or below ground. And all of a sudden now we're being stampeded into having to make a decision like in the next few days. And, and I, that, that is not a, a good uh, feeling on my part because we also haven't explored the option of an unconventional approach to at least Peavine. So, um, so I, <laughs> the decision sounds like it's already been made or about I, to be. I made. disagree that it's been made. Oh, well, uh, the budget and finance committee is bringing this to us uh, based on discussions that they've had with staff. It would have been nice so, to have gotten this information this morning. I, I don't know why we weren't presented this I, this morning. I don't have an answer for that. Uh, so, yeah, um, there is no answer. Let's um, let's proceed with with that. Um, Jamie, um, since Jeff and Gail have had input into this, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on it. So, as the only non-scientist, non-engineer, non-finance person on the board. <laughs> Um, I, I, uh, you know, want to make sure that my understandings of why we are taking the steps that we are taking are clear. And what I understand, because I hear, you know, this conflation of two different conversations happening, um, and some of it goes a little over my head sometimes. So what I hear is that uh, we have to figure out a model for how we are going to understand what our costs are, our inputs into the budget, how what our strategies are for addressing those before we can then get to the next phase of, okay, let's start putting inputs in and see what reality looks like based on this model. Now, I, I understand that there are things about this model that are imperfect because there are, there's imperfect amounts of information available to us. So at some point, in order to ensure that we can make our budget in 2024, we have to make some assumptions here, right? And go forward. Am I understanding where we're at as a board correctly? I mean- I, I believe you're correct. Yeah, we need to make some decisions. Okay. Yeah. So, so to this question, which while I know that we don't have all of the information, it's not the first time as a board we have looked at the issue of above ground versus underground. We are all aware that it will be vastly more expensive and vastly more invasive if we go underground, but that it will also have you know, tremendous other benefits in terms of reliability and stability. Those are trade-offs that we're gonna have to make as a board. Um, and, and we will not necessarily have the full and complete picture of what those costs are when we make those trade-off decisions. We don't know if we say above ground that it won't be double that number when we get, you know, I mean, we, I'm just hopefully yeah. not, but we don't know yeah. that we, but we know it will be significantly less if we select above ground than if we go underground. 
So I'm comfortable being asked to make a, a values-based decision on that question tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and, and where I was when we first heard about this was that while I, I always wish for the best possible, most stable and reliable project, I understand that we have to balance those concerns for me more importantly with the invasiveness of the impact and the length of time it would take us to construct an underground water uh, uh, main versus uh, the, the length of time that it would take us to go above ground. So that for me is a really important consideration and that's why I would be, cons I would be comfortable uh, making the assumption that we are proceeding with an above ground. Okay. Um, I like the way you characterize that. We're making a values uh, judgment here on which of these two um, for uh, putting together the budget model we want to, to use. Yes. Um, and uh, we've heard from Bob. Well, I have, I have more to say about that. this. That, um, okay. Yeah. Um, and, and let's... And and more and more to say on that particular item is that, again, as we talked about this morning, splitting P vine from the rest, mm -hmm. because yeah. one of the things that we could have as a value is protecting as much of our supply line uh, as possible. Right now, we've protected about forty percent. If we did P vine underground using unconventional methods, not building fourteen foot roadways, we could protect sixty percent. 60 is better than 40. And if we couldn't get the other 40%, well, at least we have 60%. And our future generations will thank us for that. And that the other part of this is we also don't have to be constrained by this Prop 218 process. The supply line um, projects could be handled separately through a separate Prop 218 process just like we did the CZU fire surcharge for 5 million, where we restricted it specifically to that rather than conflating these things. And the reason I get concerned about that is if you look at history, you can sometimes learn from it. The rate study that was done the last time in 2017 forecasted budgets of operating expenses increasing 3.5%. The actual budgets that were put forward were 6%. The difference between those two would have allowed us to borrow anywhere from 15 to $30 million of debt now without having to do any additional rate increases, making ourselves even better positioned. And if what we're saying is that these rate studies that people are using to base whether or not they vote is nothing more than a Valentine letter that can be ripped up at any point in the future and do whatever we want, why should they trust us now if we didn't, didn't use the last rate increase study as the basis for our budgets? Because we clearly didn't. And, and, and the difference between operating and capital, I know is sometimes hard to understand, but uh, think of it I, this way. An increase getting, in 650,000, but we're talking about debt. Yeah, I can't you're, hear, I have an auditory processing. I can only hear one person. In Let him finish. Um, I believe you're getting away from the question. I'm not getting away from the question because the question here is, do we do this now? Mm -hmm. And what is the underlying assumptions on the operating expenses that's going to drive what kind of capital we need to do? These are, these are not completely separate questions. These are completely interrelated. Keep in mind that 650,000 to 850,000 of operating margin, that is cash left over after expenses, is about 15 million in debt that we can take out. And had we followed the 3.5% increase from the last rate study through these last five years, we would have been able to take out 25 million or so in additional debt with no change in the rates. And we would be much better off right now because of the power of compounding. These are things that we are not even talking about other than to say, oh, well, that model we're putting together is just a model and no, we're not making a commitment. How can we do that to our community? Um, so Bob, I wanna, I wanna offer my opinion of these numbers 
Um, and I agree with what Jamie said. We're being asked to make a value decision at this point for the purposes of putting together um, our financial model. I feel that we should be putting in the number for the above ground cost that's being presented to us here. So uh, this is only the, the, the first of several questions. Uh, Jeff, you wanted to? Okay, so I, I think we need to do a couple of things here. First of all, I would like to make a distinction between a projection based on what current knowledge we have versus a commitment, which is a firmer type of decision. And what we're doing here is a projection with the best knowledge we have, it's imperfect. Mm -hmm. We make commitments to our constituents when we pass a budget. Every two years we pass a budget and that is a firm commitment. This is a projection, it's a forecast. It's we'll do our best to get there, but five years out, we don't know what the inflation rate will be. Three years out, we don't know. So this is, it's a, a, the best projection we can make, but we don't know. No, we do have the farther out we go, the less the less knowledge we have. Right. right. Different and questions. that's why you make your commitments based on your biannual budget. Okay. But, um, but the biannual budget is a choice um, we make. Rick, you wanted to offer something on this well, uh, at some point. Just to, to move this forward, I think from my perspective, I would move that we agree that we're moving ahead to rebuild, uh, replace the raw water supply lines and put a budget of 25 million in, which gives us time to vent out above, below, different construction techniques. Mm -hmm. If we go with a below, most likely your EIR process will be three to five years before you even start construction. Right. So we won't even be looking at the big dollar numbers in this, rate study period and we're going to then need to consider how to raise additional money yes. to cover but the rest of that put the 25 use the number of 25 million I agree. let's move ahead on p vine and let's try to get through this right. uh, this lengthy process with the board so they all have everybody has a good feeling that we've been to the different construction techniques and select we've got the time but we should at least put the 25 million in right. because we need to do p vine we've got tree work we've got a lot of work to do and we've got the time to figure out how we're going to move ahead because i can tell you right now the environmental process if we can even get through it without being sued on burying right. is a three to five year before you break ground i agree so how much did we so how much did we do with four uh, i'm sorry environmental because it was during the fire the ground was still smoking we were exempt right um, could i just expand one more thing of what i was talking about on the difference between projections and I, commitments I, I i understood what you were I, saying I, I know that but what i want to say is that the 2017 uh study rate study which i'm not sure if any of the board members current board members were here when that took place. Maybe Bob was, I don't know. I wasn't on the board, but I was yeah. involved. So that, like this, was a projection based on imperfect knowledge, but the best knowledge they had at the time. And over a period of five years, assumptions have to change things. Uh, disasters happen, inflation happens, uh, all kinds of things. And so the commitments that the board made were the biannual budgets, and they were held pretty close. They weren't biannual back then. Well, an annual budget at that point, but the commitments that were made were the budgets, and the budgets were held. Were as far as I know, I wasn't present at that time, but as far as I know, the budgets were pretty well uh, under control. Can I help? Um, can I help you with that? Because that's actually not true. In the first two years after the rate increase was passed, so I'm talking about yes. the operating expenses went up 14 percent and 7 percent. I, 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 I want to get off of that also. But the past is prologue. I want to get off of that also. We've discussed this question, and I've heard input from all of the board on this question. I'd like to move on to the other questions that were that were posed that are part of the financial model. Um, so could you pull up the second 
slide. Um, the assumptions that are in the revenue model. Um, Three-year averages uh, for, or sorry, rates of inflation for three years uh, using that and three through five using the tenure. Any comments from the board on that? Jamie, Bob, Jamie, go to you first. I don't, I don't feel like I have enough particular expertise here okay. to offer much, except to say that I, you know, and I think I'm kind of going to the next issue, but I, I, I like the adjustments that we made in terms of front loading. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with these assumptions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So right. this, this last month, we saw inflation, or the last few months, we saw inflation go down for a while. This last month, it's gone back up, um, not to where it was, but it has gone back up. Right. Um, so we, I don't think we can predict that. We're not. So we have something in the model here yeah. um, that the Budget and Finance Committee has recommended. Bob, do you care to comment on? Well, the, the three-year average, does that take it at about 4.2%, something like that? Is that the number that they're using? Uh, I'm not 4%. sure. The, it, oh, it depends on what category of expense. So general expense and salary was a little bit over 4%. The construction costs, um, Sudhir, are you, if you're still there, you can type in and correct me, but th yes. those are higher. Yeah, um, I mean, again, historically, if you look at our actual numbers, the the salaries were going up 3%, our budgets were going up 6%. So there was like an additive factor on, on top of that. Um, I don't know that the overall, I mean, at least again, looking at historical budgets, I don't know that you can just say, well, it's it's inflation because that hasn't been what they've been going up at. We um, have used 4% uh, for general expenses, including salaries. And then for utilities, as I said, we had higher percentages, I think six and a half for utilities. Okay. I mean, I'm just I'm just looking at historical numbers here, and they don't match any of those. Um, so can okay. I explain more about why they chose? Did, did Raftelis take into account historical numbers in terms of what the district has done over the last few years? That's a good question. Sudhir? So well, we basically took the budget that we were given and then used the inflation factor, so we didn't go back and try to identify the changes, previous historical changes changes in your budgets okay I, I mean again what i'm really looking for here guys is what is what the truth is going to be and if you look at our history relative to the last rate study and what the actual budgets were there, there's a big disconnect right and and we need to resolve that disconnect i hear you about projections versus actuals but the problem is you look at history they knew um, within a two-year period, they increased operating expenses by 22%. They front-loaded the money in terms of the rate increase, and the expenses were front-loaded as well. And that put you up at a higher level that you then compound growth on. I, we're, we're repeating. I mean, I, the, thing that, the thing that gets me so concerned because I've been around longer, is that I'm I'm seeing this sort of it's it's history repeating itself, exactly the same words, exactly the same structure, exactly the same um, assumptions. The fact that we're not willing to commit to something beyond two years, which was an arbitrary policy that we made, we can commit to anything we want, makes me concerned. We're going to repeat 2017 all over again. There's okay. nothing saying it won't. And at the end of the day, so, the people are going to pay the so rates, for, for whether the, or not we do the, what we the, say we're going to do. This is the question, the question that we have in front of us. That, That's why I'm asking, look um, at the historical stuff. Okay. Because and, I, and I think that um, Rev Tellis did answer your question. No, they didn't go back. Yeah, I that. mean, but okay. here's the thing. 
there's no there's no shame in saying, hey, four percent isn't what it is based in historical. It should be six or seven percent as long as that's the truth that we're going to present to the community that they can use for making their decision. Understand. But to go in with something that is that is in a repeat of 2017 that didn't come to pass. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Um, moving on then to the next uh, two items that are on here. Um, I think these are both uh, reasonable um, steps that you've taken, uh, in particular, spreading out the uh, capital projects over a longer period of time uh, based on the district's uh, spending on capital projects that we've been able to do over the last several years. So. I, okay. Part of this decision that we were, or this recommendation we were making on that was that um, the district has finite resources in terms of project engineers and and people to go out and supervise and inspect and and review bids and all of that, and we just didn't feel in the committee that we had the mm -hmm. staff yeah, bandwidth right. to do the do that much capital. Yeah. To the, and the, the level that we're in, that, in the original. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, I think I think something more like uh, ten or twelve in a peaking situation might be possible. Um, you know, we should be spending about six to seven a year in general, anyway, just based on the infrastructure we have, and then we have deferred to catch up. So that's where I come up with the ten to twelve somewhere in there. Okay. Um, why don't you pull up the next slide for us, Kendra? And some um, reserve targets. Um, I think that uh, Sudhir clearly spelled out in there uh, what the reserve target numbers are going to be. I don't see that there's anything significant and, and just to be clear it does include the debt yes. so one of the things i couldn't tell from i mean unfortunately i'm looking at bad numbers here in the in the agenda i couldn't tell if the 15 million or 19 million that we're talking about taking out if that has to be spent within three years like the other loans that we've taken out have have had covens for that we've been able to get around that because of the disasters, but the covenant is you have to spend it on project identified projects in three years. What happens to the reserve situation from a cash flow point of view? And that might be helped if I had the model. I thought the model was going to be distributed. Um, I haven't seen the model yet, but if we had the model, I could probably do some sensitivity analysis to figure that out. Mm -hmm. When we are we'll be distributed. We are planning to use up the first debt issue in the first two years. And then the next debt issue will be uh, actually, yeah, in the first two years, we plan to use up the debt funding. And then the next, and then that would take your reserves down. Um, right. So you're saying you would take out another debt in the two years after that? If we needed to, that's right. This is where I need to see the, the cash flow because right now I can't, I don't have anything here in front of me to be able to make any kind of determination. When is the model going to be delivered? Have all the tweaks been made from FEMA and all the adjustments have been made in the model? So the model is pretty sound at this point in time. She has the model can dimension. She's 15. Like more email too. Thank you. Um, and to the rest of the board. Yes. Also. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, increasing the uh, reserve levels every year. Uh, the slide that uh, Sh Sudhir showed us on that. Uh, Actually, reached... it didn't show that though. It really didn't. <laughs> increasing reserve. Okay. Yeah, I did. Did it? I, yes. I, okay. Yes, his slide showed that. Well, it, showed again, that. it depends on if you're using debt and cash, right? So. Right. Um, but 
uh, I didn't see anything that's significant with that aspect of, of what was there. Uh, front loading the reserves uh, to be higher in years one and two. Revenues. I'm revenues. sorry, revenues. Um, then in years three to five, I think um, that given everything that we've gone through, in particular uh, this year with emergencies and the rest of that, uh, being able to build up uh, revenues and front loading that is is appropriate. Bob? I'm, it would be appropriate under a similar kind possibly appropriate again i got to see the model possibly appropriate under some kind of restriction excuse me that we had on the CZU's debt surcharge and that is that this part of your bill is going for this purpose as opposed to just goes into the general fund to be spent any way we want okay I, we hear what you're saying on that um and last, do we want to uh, take out debt? Uh, we have the uh, this built on. Did, did we look at a 30 year? Um, I don't believe we did, no. no. We, yeah, we've done 20 years. Because we have two right now. One's 30, one's 20. Yeah. Two big ones, 130, 120. Okay. Uh, but if we did bond, we would do that, make that decision at a later date uh, if we had a significant uh, additional cost such as on CZU pipeline uh, where we knew we needed to have 52 million uh, maybe that's the point that we go out uh, for a bond on that which would then require a vote so and, and just to be clear the the difference on the debt is that a debt taken out under the model here is something that is equally distributed across everybody's bill effectively, right? Whereas a bond is an ad valorem tax. That means it's based on the value of your property. So people with higher values of uh, um, property pay more than those with lower values. Not so necessarily. It depends on how it's set up. Yeah, well, well, I think he really that's typically that. how you do right. it. That's typically right. how you do a bond right. is ad valorem. Yeah. That's what the school board did with their 75 million bond. Right. Um, it doesn't have to be done that way. That is but the typical way. I understand that might be typical. I don't right. want to say that that's the way that it would have, that's a parcel to, have to be done. Uh, parcel but, tax is very different than a bond. I don't, I don't want to debate how we would do a bond. Do this is not the place to do that. Right. We, agree, we agree at this point it's the model is based on revenue. If we did bond, that's something we would discuss. Any, anything later. that is on this slide is fair game for discussion. I disagree. Well, then they've, why is it on the slide? They've this staff is con or the it budget right there. The needs budget, further discussion on giving some background to the community on what that might involve. It would require further discussion years from now whenever we would go out for a bond yeah i think the yeah. question is do we want to take out debt in some form right if the answer is yes then at the point where we're faced with the question of what is the amount of money we need we well, would determine is right. does it make sense to go out with a for a regular and for yeah. the, for the purposes of, for the purposes of building the revenue model we're not assuming that it includes any bond debt so um, oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry, what? For the purposes of building the revenue model. I, I, I think it does show debt. Yes, no, it I shows debt, but does. not as bonds. Not a bond. Oh, 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 oh sorry. Okay. We've bond. taken the conservative right. approach of assuming that it yes, is it's revenue. in mm -hmm. right. the form of a loan. Right. Yeah. Is it um, a loan, 20 years, current right. rates, but when we do go out, It'll be current rates then, right. and we'll explore all the options and see which one is the most. Legally, right. we can't make that decision tonight. Yeah. All we right. can yeah. say is, yeah, we'll go seek some debt at some point. Yeah. Right. So, okay. you know, that's not a, we can't make that decision. So, um, I'm not sure if this is the, the last of the. I, I, do, of have, these. I do have a couple of questions. Okay. 
Okay. Um, I wonder if we uh, should go out to the public. They've I, been I sitting there an awful I long do time. I want to see that. Uh, <laughs> and then we can come back to the board yeah. based on uh, any public input that we have yeah. at this point. So uh, given what you've heard uh, and seen, uh, as far as these questions, uh, what questions does the public have, if any, or comments? Uh, and could you please come up to the mic? And I do want to say that uh, public presentations are uh, limited to three minutes. So I just appreciate all the information we have shared and it's being transparent as possible. But I also identify test wise for point of order, point of order, I think. Staff should address the chair and not be uh, asking speakers. I mean, if the chair wants to ask the speaker her name, okay, thank I, you. I don't think the staff thank should you. be interjecting yes. in the at this point. And also, I think that the chair should be clear that in this state, you cannot be required to say your name to participate in one of these meetings. Correct. Thank you again. Um, I'd just also like to make clear that we should not have members of the public leaping up and making points of order. So yeah, there's a three minute actually, period to speak and you'll be called at your, at your opportunity. Thank can you. Can we restart her clock? Yes, of course. You're, yeah. you're right, Jay. It's only board, I'll have board to members. Soon, can do so that. my question is, what is the hurry with the model that we were presented? Why do we have to make a decision in a week's time? Um, with the with the model that was presented, we we need to make a decision on the revenue model in order for Raftelis to take the next step, which is to start to calculate um, various alternatives for what the rate structure will be. And so they can't do that until they know how much revenue is needed. Okay, so. To stay on track on the as as um, Sudhir put up the next steps of what all the things we have to do, um, we need to make a decision on the revenue model by the end of this month, uh, end of October. Is that of is that right? End of October. He was saying October. Yeah. yeah. So in other words, that's why we're not voting on anything tonight, and we will have further discussions at the board meeting on the twenty first, um, and so. But so there's more than just a week's time. Yes. Yes. Could, yes. Thank you. For yeah. Yes. Could, okay. could we um, put the schedule back up? I, I want to make sure I understood what you just said. Sudhir? Yes. Um, uh, let me see here. The schedule next steps. Should I go or should I wait? Uh, go ahead. Let, let's let I'd, I'd like to see what the schedule is okay. so that we could conclude on that uh, first. He's uh, at the share of his screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so what, what is what, what isn't clear with on me though is is what that rates discussion with board means October 2023. That says to me that the rates that they're making a rate proposal, and in order for them to do it by October, they have to have this You're right. budget done. You're right now because we're being rushed. The end. I I misspoke. We need to do it by the end of September. Okay. So month. just wanted to. Clarify that. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Okay. Hey, um, my name's Bo Silver. Um, I'm part of the Bear Creek walk Wastewater Estates. Uh, we're 50 houses that our water rates are obscene. It was 277 four years ago, and we increased it by 70% up to $400 a month right now. So that's what I pay for wastewater. And so I guess you can ask, you're saying no. I don't know, we can talk about it after. Uh, so uh, I guess they're asking for more money or something. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's totally, I know all 50 people in, that, in the community were not giving any more money for any of that. Our rates were insanely increased. And then also there's a slide that's like, oh, we're going to do something in 2031. I don't know what that thing is. But I guess all I'm saying is that the amount of money that we pay for wastewater right now 
is completely obscene. It's not fixed right now. I'm willing to do any reasonable plan, but no reasonable person should have to pay what we pay for wastewater. And it's fine to create a cute model where like money goes up for whatever reason it goes up. But um, we were just asked at least 50% increase. I don't know if my numbers are perfect, but it's really not acceptable to ask us to pay more money. And, you know, we were told that this would get fixed and a number of something, a study was done. But I guess all I'm saying is that I'm willing to work with you guys, but there's just absolutely no way we're paying more money for the Bear Creek Wastewater Estates, 50 people. I want to create reasonable solutions. I don't, I haven't heard one yet, ever. And we're a reasonable community wanting to do reasonable things. But as Bob has kind of been saying, crazy stuff happens years ago, and I'm not forgetting that. So we're definitely voting down any rate increases for Bear Creek Wastewater Estates. I'd like to know more information rather than a slide that says we'll do something in 2031 uh, and asking for more money. Because like, let's just say the money was going up just a little bit over these years. And then you're, and that's not what happened. It was here and it went up like this. And then there's more increases. So I have no idea why there is more money being asked for. That, that uh, spike in 2031 was to allow the district to connect into a system uh, that the county <clears throat> is putting in place. Uh, the it's, it's, it's also to do uh, to, to 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 tie into CSA seven. We have to have a new collection system. Yeah, new collection system and, is coming and, either and, way. And CSA seven is is a, is the county system. Okay, but okay. I do believe that um, spike is the collection system that we have uh, uh, right. notice of violation on because of the I&I. &I. Okay. And I know we want to pick something in 2031. That makes sense. I was just curious why the rates right. were increased yeah. so largely four years ago, and then there's more money being asked for it. That's yeah. what I don't understand. If I may share, his, I think his bill is a combination of wastewater and water. OK. Well, it makes a big difference. Well, how much do you know how much we pay in wastewater? Does anyone know that? I, I don't go ahead. Two, 257. Oh, sorry, only 257 per month in wastewater. Uh, sorry about that. It, it's ridiculous. Okay. I'm not. Yeah, I have 56 like, houses. $257 per month. I know that's a lot for How much do you pay in wastewater? I am on septic. So unfortunately, well, I don't have answers. I, I hear you. I understand that's a challenge. But, but what I'm saying is $257 times 56 houses is a hundred and seventy thousand dollar annual operating budget to run your septic? It, it doesn't matter. I'm going to vote now. I like, understand, but, but I'm trying to. So you're asking, asking the question money. about yeah, why your no, bills. My, my question was: We increased it by fifty percent four years ago. I don't understand why you're asking for do more. Do you want to debate okay. though, or do you want to hear the answer to? I want to know why it was increased so much, and then there's more another increase. Yes, okay. it's, right. it's the right. basic question of what do we get for the money that we're being charged? We never. It's going to be no. We answer never question. answer that question on anything. Um, um, Rick, do you want to answer? That is do going to take a little research to be. I don't want okay. to give any information. Okay. But it's, I have no problem getting this gentleman the information, but I just okay. sit here and give it off the top of my head. All right. I want to be accurate. That's okay. okay. We'll vote for okay. something, but you can't just arbitrarily just, just increase something. Okay. Just, just for perspective, the first vote that was taken the last time rate increase was proposed, they defeated it. I, we understand that. Okay. We'll do that again. Thank you. Too. you Thank give you. us real answers for why you're asking. That's why they've okay. been out of compliance for um, the last It's not my problem. Time. That's your problem. And I'll I vote now. I want to get off of that. I was I told my house to get rent tape. To you anymore? Do you know someone told me my house was going to get rent tape and it didn't? So that's not my problem. I will vote no. no. My problem is to vote yes or no. Thank you. you can give me the right numbers. Thank okay. you for your input. Rick has agreed to, to follow up to get some additional great. information. Thanks, but he Rick can't always does a great job. I don't know if I have your contact. Though. Oh, I would love to give it to you. So I will give you mine. Thank you. I'm not confrontational. I promise I'm a sweet, happy, normal guy. I'm just trying to get some answers. Okay. Okay. It's always a great guy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Your next commenter. Hello, Jill Gary from YCK Campbell. And I just apologize for my ignorance and where all this information is. Um, are your budgets online? Yes. Okay. And I understand the basics of budgeting and reserves and all of that. So I'll reserve, I'll look at them and then hopefully be able to propose some thoughts and questions about that. I was just wondering. We can put whatever we're going to put in reserves, but if you don't financially make it for the year, my guess is that you will then use the reserves for operating. Is that incorrect or correct? 
I don't, I don't have an answer on that, uh, Rick. That'd be correct. Yeah, that, that would be correct. Hopefully, it doesn't, that doesn't reach that. But, you know, it's has that been the history? I do believe it probably has been the history um, from time to time. You know, with different disasters that we've had. I mean, we don't have a crystal ball. If, if there's no disasters and no COVID and supply chain issues and all the problems we've had over the last what five or plus years. We probably would meet all these normal inflation rates and so forth. Well, I understand that but too. Because I have to manage a bunch happened, of it my job, so I get uh, it, and I know how we use reserves. Very difficult. But yes, that oh, would be where we would go to okay. uh, reserves. Right. So okay. then we're creating reserves that we might have to use for operating. So based on history, that might happen, and we have no idea what's going to happen. What this winter is going to be here next summer or whatever. So I get a hundred percent of that. Um, when it's talking about the revenue, and if we we have to come up with a model, to me, I, I would would have hoped to have a model that's based on reality of how we know it right now. If it's just a guess, I get all of that, but it could be fifty two for the above grounds, and then mm -hmm. then where we're at, and then if it comes down to the rate increases, something like the property that I manage, whatever the value is or whatever the what it comes down to will just negatively impact the people that we serve. Mm -hmm. So I know that, you know, that's, that's in that equation, but I think uh, as far as budgeting, being able to see it and be able to comment on it and to be able to understand what changes you make along the way would be helpful for me as a property manager. I don't know if the wine safe Silicon Valley owns it, but I think, Understanding that you're you're trying to make make a model based on unknowns, mm -hmm. um, that I don't see why you wouldn't look at history, because even when I'm making my budget, I look at 2019, mm -hmm. and then is it real or is it not? But we're now having to make a decision on something that we don't know about, or you guys do. I don't have any part in this, but it seems like an odd process. Is all I'm going to say. But I would think that based on however you use reserves. Um, you know, I think we're, we're, we're you're going to use the reserves for operating. That makes sense. But if we don't increase them each year, then okay. then we'll be in the same situation that we're at. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, anybody else? Uh, I'm Bruce Holloway uh, from Boulder Creek. I went to both committee meetings this week. Um, the the Budget and Finance Committee did not have the above ground, below ground issue on the agenda at all, but it was substantially discussed. Um, and uh, and I told them that it was on the agenda for the engineering committee this week, uh, but they've already made their decision, even though it was an unagendized item. So I'm kind of disturbed by the process. I've been to lots of local government meetings um, you need to stick to the Brown Act. You need to stick to an agenda. They got off topic as far as I'm concerned. And it almost sounds like it's being brought to the board tonight to make this above ground, below ground decision. I mean, it was right on the slide with question mark. Answer the question. And yet it's not on the agenda tonight at this meeting. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess everybody could, could walk out of this meeting and say, well, we decided that. We decided to go above ground. And other people in the community who, who might have even looked at the agenda tonight would be very surprised that that was the outcome of this meeting. Um, another thing that, that was on the agenda for the Budget and Finance Committee was reserve policy. There was an item on the agenda for reserve policy. I attended the whole meeting. Um, it was repeatedly said that the meeting had to end at five, and started at four, had to end at five, had to end at five. Finally went on to 5.15, I guess. But there never was a point in the discussion when uh, the chair said, oh, now we're moving on to reserve policy, and we're going to discuss reserve policy. So my impression was reserve policy didn't get discussed at all at the budget and finance meeting. So one of the points that I would have made if, it had actually, if they had actually followed their agenda um, I don't know this two and a half percent number. I don't understand it. Uh, it. In some cases, it could be too much, and in other cases, it could be too little. 
Um, if if uh, the asset that you're talking about is something like a roof uh, that only gets replaced every 30 years, then two and a half percent, just just to say, oh, we should keep two and a half percent every year. Um, it doesn't really solve the problem. You could have two and a half percent every year for 29 years, and then the 30th year, you're gonna have to borrow it to be able to do that project. Um, other times, I think it's too much uh, for this district. Uh, probably most of the assets are either pipes or tanks. And because you have so many diverse assets, uh, you, you actually need to spend two and a half percent every year. You need to spend two and a half percent every year of your tanks and of your pipelines. So the two and a half percent for those assets is more like an annual, uh, an annual budget item. Yeah, it's pretty much pay as you go. Um, and I see I'm out of time, but uh, I, I think you should be careful of the Brown Act. I, I, I you're guess. not speaking okay. to your agendas. And you're, you're getting off topic and getting on the items that are not oh, agendas. Oh, um, I have folks that want to comment, Jamie. I, so, I, I, can I just you, correct that? Um, let me have Jamie speak to it and then you can't go. I, I just wanted to say that for, for my part, I don't believe that we're making a decision a bit about above ground or below ground tonight. Um, maybe it's, it was not phrased in the perfect way, but I think what we're making a decision about is how much money do we want to project in future budgets for project costs associated with Peavine. And we are saying, based on our best all knowledge all right all now, all we are willing to, well, at least what I'm saying is based on our best knowledge right now, I'm willing to project 25 million. Now, as we continue to develop our understanding of that project and receive more information about it, if we have to revise our assumptions, mm -hmm. we will then have to seek additional funding. This is a an unfortunate but very common process that happens in public government budgeting. It is unfortunately why you you know you see inflationary costs in projects over time because it takes time to understand and get to those numbers. We have to go through a long environmental process before we can truly understand what the cost is because then we'll know what are the you know factors that we need to consider for that project. And we just can't have all of that information at the point that we have to set a budget. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I, I do have a comment on that to follow up on that, which is very quickly, which is we could have had that information because we asked for a lot of this a year ago. Okay. So we, 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 that we're doing it to ourselves for not having it. I disagree with Bob's comment. Uh, we've been working with outside uh, consultants to try to get to that point. Uh, we don't have it yet, but. Uh, for the purposes of what we want to put into the budget. I agree with Jamie's statement that putting that 25 million in now is appropriate. So I'd like to go back to public uh, comments to see if we can conclude on that. Yes, I'm Jim Mosier, I'm from Felton and I'm on the budget finance committee as a citizen member. And uh, just to clarify, um, what was on the agenda was to go through these very slides and make comments and, and uh, give advice to staff and to Rav Tellis about what the Budget and Finance Committee uh, felt about it. The major decision, a major issue in that slide present, presentation was two scenarios. One was above ground and one was below ground. So when I prepared for the meeting, that was a major issue that I thought we were going to be discussing. And I think it was part of the agenda because it was part of the slide because that was one of the key decisions that this board has to make. <clears throat> so I, I'm just a little baffled by saying we violated the Brown Act by talking about that very decision that is set so central to the, to the um, uh, material that was presented to our committee. Uh, two quick things, just to my comments about what uh, the questions that you're addressing tonight. One is that I do believe the above ground is the best approach for a variety of reasons uh, that have already been uh, spoken about. I won't repeat them, but I think uh, the idea that we, uh, I think some of the environmental issues, the uh, issue around whether we get uh, the kinds of problems we have uh, with uh, FEMA uh, um, is just uh, makes the, the varying option really problematic, even aside from the what we expect to be much higher costs. I wish we had an act, you know, some sort of estimate other than sort of feels like it's being pulled out of a hat, 25 million. 
Um, but you have to have a number to stick in there. So I agree with James. Uh, that's a, probably a good conservative number to use at this point for above ground. I still think that the projections for how much capital work you're going to do each year, even though you lowered your one from 27 to 24, is unrealistic. I just don't see this district spending $24 million. You, you could have the money in the bank, but it's just, that's not been our history. Um, so I think it's still unrealistic, and I think it would help uh, in, in terms of um, in terms of being real, more realistic about what we can get done to look look at the history of how much we can get done with all of the permitting, the supply chain problems, um, uh, the the construct you know getting construct. Look at the fish lab uh, as an example. So I just wonder if you want to re uh, continue to relook at that one issue. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to turn to uh, members that are attending virtually, uh, the public. Um, Cynthia Denzel. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, I just wanted to congratulate you on discussing so many issues that are contentious and important to the public and to your process there. I'm aware that other government agencies um, in our area are having trouble attracting and keeping personnel, and that really complicates the process of getting any work done. If you don't have project managers, if you don't have people to uh, do the environmental reviews and take into consideration all the factors um, and do public outreach, you're handicapped and I think that we are in that position with the loss of personnel and our future change of director. I'm, you know, I'm in favor of increasing the inflation number for staff and that part of operating expenses, because I think that's a realistic assumption. So thank you very much for your work. I really appreciate your, the input of all of the board members. Thank you. Okay. Um, Alina Lang. Hi, Alina Lang of Boulder Creek. Um, I do apologize. I had conflicting meetings. I had a BCE meeting, so I missed the first half, but I was very surprised to log in and see that you guys were discussing uh, – <laughs> above grade versus below grade. And I was even um, more confused because I am um, a committee member on the Environmental Engineering Committee and we had a meeting this morning at 9 a.m. where we were, I was on the agenda to talk about above or below grade and we, the physical impact uh, for above grade was listed as TBD and below grade was uh, 61.64 million. And then your slide here was saying like 52 and 25, and you guys had a number suddenly between, between 9 a.m. and now of, of 25. So um, that that's pretty confusing. And I feel like that uh, we asked for that information in the E&E &E committee like forever ago. Um, and they came back again to the committee without those numbers. And I don't know how the budget and, and finance or how they got those numbers and then are all on board to go with above ground. And I, I just I just feel left out of this conversation when it was agendized on our meeting today. Um, that's all. But thank you for your hard work on this. I, I know it's a lot. OK. Thank you, Alina. Um, uh, Chris. Schulmeyer. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm the SLV superintendent. Uh, and I just um, been listening to everything. I don't really get involved in other district budgets. Um, ours is big enough to handle. Uh, did we lose I don't think he wants to make a comment. He's just listening. Oh. Okay. okay. Uh, Hello? That's it. That's it, Chris. Sorry, no, but I'm not sure if I'm coming through. 
Yes, you are. We can hear you. I, I'm just asking when you move forward for the rates structure, if you take in consideration that the school district, which is the largest employer and one of the largest users of water, we can't charge people more um, when our rates go up. So it's a direct impact to our operation budget. And a lot of cities and water districts take in consideration their school districts and things like that when they're doing the rate structure. The last one really substantially increased our water rate when the tiers changed and we are treated like a residential. And so whenever you're considering that, can you keep in mind our school district, the largest employer and one of the largest users and how that rate will impact us as a school district? That's all I'm asking. Okay. We will, Thank and you. that's part of the next, the next step. Yes. Okay. Um, that's all the uh, folks from the public that I see online who wanted to comment. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like Pre to see if we could uh, go back Pre to the board. President Hello. Smalley, may I, uh, may sure. I interject? Sure. So we have quite a few unknowns, I think. Director Fultz is talking about the operating costs going up potentially. And then we have questions about, you know, which particular option we should be having in terms of underground and above ground. The, uh, if, we dis if we make a decision to go one way or another, supposing we go with the scenario one, which is the above ground scenario, we are looking at 10% for two years and then 7% for subsequent years. And if it turns out that your operating costs are higher, uh, you know, and you're not going to be able to meet them with the rates that we have implemented, obviously you're going to have to do another 218 notice, go through another rate study. If you decide to go with scenario two, which is the higher revenue adjustments, which are 12% for the first two years, and then I think it is 8% for the subsequent three years, you have some options there in you know if you decide to go with above ground you don't need to increase your rates as much as we are saying you first of all the op, the decision as to the debt issue can be made will be made sometime next year in the middle of spring or even maybe you know say in spring you know so you have time for that decision you may have better numbers by that time as to you know which option is going to cost you how much so the question is, you know, do you want to bite the bullet and go with the more conservative rates, which is the higher rates right now? And if it turns out that you don't need to have those kinds of expenses, both in terms of operations and or capital, you can always go with lower revenue adjustments and what you put in your 218 notice. The question is, are you willing to bite the bullet with those higher rates that, that we are proposing under scenario two for the water enterprise? I think um, if that helps you make a better decision, kind of, you know, helps to decide at this point, there are several still unknowns. And so you decide whether you want to go with that option. You don't need to do another 218 notice, hopefully, if you decide to go above ground, because you would have adequate revenues in that case to cover any increases in operating costs as well. Okay. Um, we understand your, your question. Uh, the um, feel that I have from most of the rest of the board is utilizing the $25 million number for the purposes of putting together um, the budget, the revenue model that we're preparing. So uh, we haven't voted on that. Yeah, I, I, I think I mean, he makes a, an important point that we haven't really thought about it that way. Mm -hmm. um, which, which is another way of thinking about it rather than talking about above ground or below ground. It's basically just what, what kind of revenues we mm -hmm. need. And I, I think that's worth all of us thinking about and discussing on the 21st. And so okay. just like everything else, I don't think we're trying to come to conclusions tonight. I think no. we're trying to um, lay things out and um, get public feedback and part of the reason we did what we did, I know Bob is ob objecting, but we were trying to, to focus the discussion so that these things would be surfaced so the public has something to respond to and the board has something to re respond to. Um, and so that's, that's, that's okay. what we did. Okay. And I appreciate the questions being put out mm -hmm. this way. I left the last 
meeting with what were they what, asking, what were they asking us to decide? <laughs> yeah. So okay, uh, Bob. Well, it would have been most helpful for the public to be able to comment if the presentation had been in the agenda. Uh, it's kind of hard when you don't have all of that. I have a number of things I want to say, um, and they relate to everything that's talked about tonight. The first one is when it comes to the Brown Act, we all really need to listen to Bruce Holloway. Um, the, I'm looking at the uh, agenda for the Budget and Finance Committee. I don't see the presentation in there. I don't see anything about above ground, below ground in the agenda. There might be something else attached, but I don't, I don't see it. I do see the capital, um, the reserve policy discussion. So, you know, Bruce was absolutely right about that. I had one clarification on the number. I wanted to make sure that um, I understood properly. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think it's one of your slides, but it is one of the slides in the agenda. Um, well, maybe it is. The top line water revenue number, does that include the CZU surcharge or is that exclusive of the CZ surcharge? Uh, I'm not sure which revenue number you're looking at. Uh, well, I, again, I wish I could give you the number, but it's since things seem to be different from what's in the board packet, let me go to the one that I have in the board packet and I'll give you an example. Hang on a sec, got to scroll down. Backup slides, not for distribution. Okay. Um, in the financial plan scenario one, option one, that's in the agenda, there's a, a source of funds, water rate revenue. In 2024, it's $12,019,208. Does that include the CZU surcharge or is that exclusive of the CZU surcharge? Actually, I don't see that number in my model here. So I, I know it's because of the the fact that we're looking at different yeah slides. This this would have been um, if you, if you go to the agenda, um, it's in the agenda on page. Oh God, this is why the, everything needs to line up when you're having a meeting. Lindsay, do you recall whether uh, the Surcharge revenue is included in the top line water rate revenue in our model? Uh, I believe it is. Okay. I'm not looking at the model. Why just surcharge, make... hold on, 34. Oh. So if it is, I mean, one of the things that the board established as policy when we did the surcharge was that would be accounted for separately and would not be included in general budget numbers like that because it's misleading. You can't use that million dollars for anything that you want. It's specific for the CZU. And that distorts um, the revenue number relative to the expenses. Well, so. the thing is basically all of your revenues wind up in a pot and then it doesn't matter whether the pot has, you know, one revenue or another revenue. It is going to be used. We are saying it is going to be used to fund your capital expenses as shown on that chart. So it doesn't really matter. Once it comes in, it gets mingled with everything else. It's I, understand, like I understand money is fungible, but from a presentation point of view, it's misleading for the public. We actually. Well, we then why did we set the policy then? Because of course, it's misleading. About two different things, it's Bob. You are misinforming the public because you are conflating two entirely different. I'm not conflating. I'm are trying to misinforming the public I'm because you are conflating to, two different things. I'm trying to separate two things so that we aren't misinforming no, you are, the public. You are attempting to misinform the public because right. you are conflating two different okay. things as you often do. I, okay, okay, really, In, we'll have a discussion about finance later. Uh, the next question I have about this, um, hang on a sec. If, if I can interrupt you for just one second, the water capital slide that we showed shows the brown bars, which are representing the fire surcharge being used to finance the capital projects. What I'm trying to do is make sure when I'm looking at the model that we're gonna get tomorrow, that I'm understanding what that number is. If that number is excluding the CCU surcharge, that will lead me to a different conclusion. Uh, but thank you for, for clarifying that it does. I was actually, I was mistaken. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the model now. It does not include the fire surcharge. Oh, even better. So that's good. 
Okay, so that number is pure fixed and variable uh, revenue. That's correct. Okay. Okay. I'm not well enough to stay much longer, so I'm okay. going to have to leave. Okay. All right. Thank you, Gil. I, I, I have one other comment, and that is doing the vote over the holiday. So this Prop 218 process is already rigged enough because it's a negative vote. If you don't vote, it's the same as voting yes. So you're not really actually voting for something. You're voting against something. So by doing it over the holiday, when people are not tuned in to anything but family and the holiday season and the spirit and all that, that doesn't seem to me to be a very transparent thing to do. What does that have okay. to do with the revenue model, Bob? And also, because we're talking about the schedule. Because the schedule to... here is related to when we're supposed to do things. That's why it's all interrelated. Um, you commented on this at the previous meeting, Bob, but the last one. So you commented on it again. Okay. Well, we I, had the same presentation I, again, so we get to make a lot of the same I, comments I, I, again. I understand Actually, your we comment. We got the presentation again so that we could hear from the public again. Right. We've heard from you. Okay. Here. And I want to share with the public right. my same right. comments. Okay. And I'm sorry you guys find them tedious. We, but I see new faces here today. Okay. So, okay. And we understand your concern with. Doing that vote. So I, could I we so. could we have that as a discussion item and an action item at the same time we're talking about finalizing the budget? Because if we aren't doing the vote over the um, holidays, we might have a couple extra weeks, a meeting, perhaps to be able to allow us to get better numbers on the above ground or a hybrid above below ground or below ground. I'm, I'm not willing to uh, do anything further with that above ground, below ground, to put any contingencies on trying to come to a conclusion on that. Okay. So from your point this, of view, we've already, rate, so from your point of view, we thing. decided tonight without a vote, 25 million. No, no, no. Okay. We no. haven't taken a no. vote on anything. We've We're had discussions tonight. about our opinions. We're having a discussion. But We're you're saying that you're not willing to do anything more about this? Um, so what? So next week, we're, what is it that we're going to do? We're, we're going to have further discussions on this next week. Using I, the $25 million number. That's going to be put up in front of us? Yes. The burying it is going to be put in front of us also. Keep, keep, so, in, keep in mind that the peer review process that was done on the original Friar and Loretta mm -hmm was delivered to us on November 22nd. I know we asked for numbers after that was delivered. We are now 10 months later. Yes. And we still don't have a number. And now all of a sudden we got to make a decision. So Mark, isn't this what we always do? Uh, could, could I make a comment? Sure. Um, the fact that we've ended up with one presentation on the screen, one on the agenda, the fact that the Budget and Finance Committee ended up discussing things that were not on the agenda. And I, part of that was because Gail has been ill and didn't have time to really work on the agenda. But um, we're moving a little too fast here because we're out running ourselves and finding ourselves in board meetings here where we we aren't quite ready to make decisions. We don't have all the information. I think one of the next steps has to be to take a good hard look at that calendar and say, do we need to throw a couple extra weeks in here to catch up with all this stuff? What does catching up with all this stuff look like though? That's Well, for example, we may be able to get some better numbers on the above ground, below ground. We may be able to answer some of the other questions that have come up tonight on the model. Um, just the, the complications of having to publish agendas, uh, we're, we're, we're moving faster than we can get agendas published is what I'm getting at here. Okay. And so I think we, we just need to take a deep breath. 
Can I say something? Sure. First of all, I want to acknowledge a couple of things. Staff's working under difficult conditions. This will be next week will be the fourth board meeting in uh, four weeks, right? So that's turning an agenda every couple of days to try and get it out. That's hard. We're doing it under the con I, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me finish. We're doing it under the, the conditions of having uh, some brand new staff members in place who are still getting their feet on the ground and understanding you know, what's happening and losing some staff, critical staff members that we're gonna have to replace. And so, you know, I, I think that a little bit of grace and you know, the imperfection in the process is understandable. But I also wanna respond to this idea that the Prop 218 process is inherently rigged. That is Bob's opinion of a legal process that has been governed and passed by the state of California and dictates to us the way we are allowed to set our rates. Now, I understand Bob doesn't like the process and Bob disagrees that that's the way the process is set, but unfortunately that is the process that is, as it is given to us by the state of California. And so I really find using language to talk about a legal process we're required to follow as rigged is inflammatory and misleading to the public and unfair to the board because we are following a process that we are required to follow by law. That's uh, all I wanted to say. As I said, it is my opinion, as all things Why are- Why do the here. rest of us have to ask you to speak, but, but he just answers? Well, be, because that was I'm, a fairly I'm, direct- I'm looking at Bob. That, that's, a, that's a fairly direct um, comment to me. And I think my article basically explained where I'm at in this. I recognize that it's something that was passed by the uh, public. I don't know that they understood it, but I think it, but I recognize it was passed. However, there's no, re there, there's, there's no requirement that we have to follow the minimum standard that is allowed under the law. We can do what we want as long as we are following the law. Following the law does not make it rigged. I am taking issue with the way that you choose well, it's a, it's to a rigged, characterize it's a the process. Vote. It's a rigged vote. I listen to you. I, 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 disagree I, that it's, I disagree that it's a rigged vote. It is the um, way that the law is, governs the process. You don't like it. Take it up with your process. legislator. Sure. Yes. It, it's rigged in the sense that people aren't voting for Write a letter I to our jail teller. I disagree with that, Bob. Okay, but, fine. Uh, I, I, I understand. We can we can continue to battle with this. And we're not going to change each other's minds at this point. Um, for the purposes of what we were uh, asked to do here this evening, which was comment on the Ref Tellus uh, presentation in the race study, I think we've concluded that part of the process. So um, with that, I'd like to adjourn. I so move. Thank you.